Welcome back everyone to another video with Scruffy Tales. In this video we will take a closer look at the legendary tank known as the S-Tank. A tank that has been misunderstood and underestimated ever since it was first revealed to the world back in the early 60s. After World War II, Sweden wanted a domestically produced main battle tank. A tank that could well and truly dominate on the battlefield. Relying on British Centurion tanks wasn't really what the Swedish army wanted, even though it provided Sweden with a finished, functional and powerful main battle tank. In Sweden, the Centurion would be known as the STRV-101, STRV-102 and later the STRV-104 depending on version. But in the 50s, work was progressing on a domestic tank, based on concepts that had been looked at as early as during World War II. When Sweden obtained data from Britain on where their tanks during World War II was the most often struck during tank-on-tank uh, -tank combat, they found that the turret had taken a huge portion of the tank destroying hits, and that the further down on the vehicle you went, the less hits overall had connected with the tanks. The Swedes concluded that the best way to counter incoming fire was for the tank to have as low of a profile as possible. By removing the turret, you would make the tank vastly more difficult to spot and to hit. And even when you did hit, chances were that you would not hit a flat angle that favored penetrating armor. German armored vehicles like the Sturmgeschütz and Jagdpanther, who did not have rotating turrets, were looked at for inspiration. Trials in the 40s with a 120mm automatic main gun had proven that you could successfully operate a tank without a loader. 120mm was deemed a bit excessive and a 105mm gun was more than capable of meeting the combat requirements of the 50s and 60s. Sweden now had an idea of what they wanted, a tank without a turret that ensured an increased chance of survival. Removing the turret meant you removed weight, so you could increase armor, again increasing your chances of survival. Although they didn't want too much armor either, a light tank could more easily traverse terrain and move around faster on the battlefield. The new tank was designed with two engines, a diesel and a gas turbine. The gas turbine would be used to provide an increase in power during combat and tactical maneuvering. The diesel engine was also placed up front due to necessity thanks to the design of the vehicle. This meant the tank risked losing the engine if hit in the front. But at the same time it provided added protection that meant that the crew stood a greater chance of survival. After all, it was back then the same as it is to this very day, that it is easier to replace a tank than it is to replace trained and experienced crew. Sweden also relied on a conscription army, which meant each year a new batch of soldiers would be trained, each year a new group of mechanics would be trained. This provided Sweden with an interesting opportunity. By designing a tank from the ground up, Sweden could design a tank that was conscription friendly, easy to learn, easy to use, easy to maintain, and easy to repair. In the end, Sweden had a vehicle that was ready to be evaluated by the armed forces. Low profile, good protection, light and maneuverable, easy to learn and use, and its gun was a British main battle tank cannon attached to an automatic loader. The armed forces were looking at three possible candidates for its next main battle tank at the time. The American option, the A tank. The German option, the T tank, since Tyskland is Swedish for Germany. And the S tank, the Swedish option. It was concluded that the S tank 
had as good armor as the A tank and almost as good maneuverability as the T tank. The low profile also impressed during the trials. Having a fixed gun was proven no liability at all. Few tanks of the era could fire accurately on the move, so it was standard practice to stop in order to fire, despite having a turret, since the S tank could turn its chassis and gun faster than the other tanks could turn their turrets, the S tank could actually engage targets more quickly than the competitors with turrets. In the end, the S tank was given the green light to become Sweden's future main battle tank. Being the third Swedish tank with a gun in the 100 plus millimeter range, the S tank officially became known as the STRV 103. SRV being short for Stridsvagn, the Swedish word for tank, or if you want a word for word translation, chariot, or battle wagon if you want to be technical. The STRV 103 managed to accurately hit its targets thanks to an ingenious hydropneumatic control system that allowed the tank to carefully be adjusted to aim the cannon by moving the entire chassis as required. The automatic loader allowed the gun to fire every three seconds. The STRV 103 was light, fast and maneuverable, had capable armor, was extremely difficult to detect and hit, and its main gun, being secured to the hull, had a longer barrel compared to many other tanks of the era, which meant it enjoyed increased accuracy, as well as an increase in its anti-tank capability in terms of penetrating power. Ammunition was stored in the rear in two separate compartments to increase the safety for the crew. In total, the STRV-103 carried 50 rounds with it into combat. Two linked FN mag medium machine guns were mounted on the front armor, as well as a third FN mag on the commander's dome. Interestingly enough, for a moment a 20mm automatic cannon was considered to be mounted on top of the tank but it was never realized. As technology advanced and the years went by, the STRV-103 was continuously upgraded with better systems. More armor was added, smoke launchers, illumination launchers, infrared floodlights, laser rangefinders and more, such as being amphibious in order to cross the many rivers and lakes of Sweden. Additional fuel was added in the shape of fuel cans mounted along either flank of the vehicle which had the additional effect of being a very early version of ERA armor. But two of the most famous additions were fitted to the front armor. The bars that could fold up at the front of the tank not only made it easier to camouflage the vehicle, but they also served to catch incoming heat rounds and possibly even deflect more traditional anti-tank munitions. This meant that the STRV-103 for a couple of decades was the tank with the most potent frontal protection. And of course, the plow. If my memory isn't completely off, I think it was every third tank or some such that was outfitted with the plow. If I'm wrong, please correct me in the comment section. Uh, the plow allowed the tank to construct earthworks like ditches and walls for added protection and camouflage. And also, it gave these tanks the ability to fill up trenches and other similar obstacles so that the tanks could advance without issue. So far, we've described a very technologically advanced machine. But we do need to remember that it was from the beginning designed to be used by conscripts. It was designed from the start to be easy to learn and easy to use. Simple controls allow the designers to duplicate controls. As such, every crew member, all three, had the ability to drive and maneuver the vehicle. The commander had an exact copy of the driver's controls. Since the tank relied on an autoloader, there was no need for a crew member to load the gun, since the driver was responsible for aiming the gun by aiming the entire hull of the tank, the driver was also the gunner. So, since the commander had the exact same controls as the driver, 
he could not only drive, he could also shoot. Technically, the STRV-103 was a main battle tank that only required a single crew member to be fully combat efficient. The third crew member who was facing the rear of the vehicle was the radio operator. This role was more or less added due to psychological reasons. The tank could work just fine with only two crew members. There was no need for a specific radio operator. But studies had shown that a crew of three would endure the hardships of war more easily, purely psychologically, than a crew of two. The open design within the tank also took psychology into consideration, not only so that the crew could have more ways to escape a burning tank. The open design, with all crew being able to talk and turn around to look at each other, also strengthened them psychologically, according to studies. And just like with the driver, gunner and commander, the radio operator was given his own set of controls that allowed him to drive the tank in reverse. And incredibly enough, the tank was just as fast in reverse as it was going forward. This idea wasn't new, as Sweden had used smaller scout cars with this exact design back in the 30s, with the ability to switch to a second driver who was able to go full speed in reverse. So, on paper, the S-Tank, the STRV-103, was without a doubt an incredible tank. But that was on paper. How would it manage if it went up against proper opposition, if it was properly tested by armies outside of Sweden? In 1967, in Norway, the S-Tank was tested right next to the German Leopard 1. The trials proved that the S-Tank could more easily spot targets than the Leopard, and that the S-Tank also was faster to align with the target and hit it. This was in part thanks to the ability that the commander could drive and shoot. If the commander saw a target, he simply took control of the vehicle and engaged the target in question. The S-Tank managed this both when being stationary as well as when being on the move. Like we pointed out earlier, even tanks with turrets had to stop to shoot at the time, and the S-Tank could turn faster than a turret. In 1968, in England, the British concluded after six months that the S-Tank was indeed a main battle tank, and not a tank destroyer or assault gun. They also acknowledged that the design had several significant advantages. In 1973, in Germany, the S-Tank was pitched against the British Chieftain Tank in realistic war exercises over several weeks. The S-Tank did not fall behind in any category and was even proven to be a more reliable machine than the Chieftain. At the end of the trials, the British could not come to any conclusion that pointed to a turretless tank was inferior to a more classic design of tank with a turret. In 1975, trials were had in the US, where the STRV-103 would be pitted against the American M60. Again, in realistic war exercises, the S-Tank proved that it was in no way inferior to a standard tank over several weeks of war games. A famous training exercise took place in Sweden in 1997, when six S-Tanks went up against six Leopard 1s. All six Leopard 1s were knocked out in the mock battle. Only one S-Tank was taken out. The S-Tank saw service between 1967 and 1997, and close to 300 were built. Not a single S-Tank was sold abroad, despite international trials proving that the S-Tank was just as capable as any other tank in taking the fight to the enemy. At times, it was even a better design for offensive action. Modern myth has it that the S-Tank was a defensive tank, designed and built to shoot and scoot, to hit and run. While it obviously was quite capable at performing hit and run attacks, it was also one of the world's most aggressive and offensive tank designs, able to quickly spot targets and able to quickly turn to fire, and thanks to its autoloader, 
repeatedly fired time and time again on target until the enemy was out of action. The S-Tank, the STRV-103, was a main battle tank in every sense of the word. A nugget from the Cold War is that Sweden almost designed the world's first depleted uranium round, specifically for the STRV-103. But while initial tests showed promise, the project was ended ahead of time. Considering how exceptionally well the STRV-103 was able to operate, imagine the STRV-103 fully loaded with 50 depleted uranium rounds, the first in the world to do so if it had become reality. The STRV-103 would have been the world's most advanced and most deadly main battle tank. Something some argue it still managed to achieve with its low profile, and its excellent gun. Thank you for watching, and I hope you found this video educational, and hopefully you learned something new about the legendary S-Tank. See you in the next one. Bye.